Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for our gallery's first webinar um, during this MCO. Obviously, it's something that we decided to put together because, well, you all can't be coming to the gallery. And so here I am sitting at home. It's all a bit strange. Um, and we thought we'd want to put together a, a topic uh, which is broad enough for everyone to relate to. And we've managed to get on three really interesting panelists to, to share with us their experiences. So let's get on to it. What makes art powerful? Um, you know, art, I think, as a whole, makes us feel understood sometimes, empowered. It feels us, makes us feel less alone. I think, you know, even judged by some of the music videos or the theater and the opera that's been coming online um, during, the, during this lockdown period worldwide. Um, I think it brings art, in some sense, brings purpose to humanity. And we hope that today, this forum will allow you to understand through the stories of our three panelists how art can heal, how it can affect social change, um, open up dialogues and adjust the way we see things. And then hopefully, in the best case, it can empower and it can transform and it can inspire. So each of our panelists um, today, um, they are Yao Biling, Malaysian artist Yao Biling, Xiao Chong Him, a filmmaker, and um, Indonesian artist Dadan Kristanto. Each of them have very different forms of expression, but I think what really unites and defines them is their ability to create forms of art which draw from their own very personal, sometimes traumatic life experiences. And I think there's nothing purer or more compelling than a story that draws from the reality of a life lived. So I'm going to start now with Yao Biling. Can we introduce Yao Biling onto, onto the screen so you can all see her face? Um, and um, we will we will um, we will speak. So this is Biling. Right. Anyway, so thank you, thank you, Biling, for being with all of us today. Um, I'm just going to do a quick introduction. Yao Biling is um, no stranger to the Malaysian art scene. Um, she's had a 25 year career as a painter, as an artist, um, and her works are consistently echo her observations of the world around her, about her life experience, about you know, what she's been through as a human being. And she struggles to reconcile the broad gambit of human experiences through her work. Her work is strongly linked to her life, and you know all the struggles and it's sincere and it's honest in its delivery and it echoes her subconscious it, it permeates with energy so Beeling, here we are today um you know um can you um i think we're, what we're going to start off with is we're going to start off with a small short video um documentary that we've actually Put together some of you may have watched it already but we're just going to play it now it's a six minute video just to sort of giving you a, a quick introduction into um Beeling's work in a nutshell so hopefully the video will will come on shortly <laughs> malaysian woman painter yao billing sees her practice as an extension of her life journey her paintings echo the twists and turns of her emotional state of mind as she is confronted by the challenges of a life lived. Throughout her 25-year career as an artist, each series is always an evolution from her previous visual language. Early in her career, Yao Biling was particularly known for her family series, which started in 1995. These figurative paintings depict intimate family portraits and daily domestic scenes. As you can see, the figures gathered around dinner tables have exaggerated head proportions. Their features were painted with almost childlike simplicity rather than a realistic style, taking her inspiration from painters Peter Blake and Stanley Spencer. It is overall a series that revolves around the context of home, portraying her relationship with her siblings, parents, and other family members. One would notice a significant change in her paintings as she got married and moved out from her family home. Settling down with her husband, with only the two of them living in their new home, she started to feel a certain loneliness compared to how she used to be surrounded by her family members. Therefore, in contrast to her previous series, on moving out and moving in shows no presence of human being at all. There is an absence of figure in the series as she shifts her focus to painting everyday objects instead. 
from cooking utensils to houseplants, consistently depicting the notion of home, yet through a different approach. Through the elimination of human figures in her paintings, she highlights the void that she felt in her everyday life, and with this comes her yearning for motherhood, the desire to become a mother, which later on came true. With the birth of her first child, a new style of work started to materialize slowly. As she was taking care of her baby, paying full attention on him, she felt taken by the facial expressions of her child and was inspired to paint portraits. Her Portraits of Paradox series, painted in 2008, reveals a new level of maturity in her work due to the changes that she experienced on a personal level. At first sight, one would notice bold outlines forming large portraits of anonymous faces. However, as you observe the paintings closer, you will begin to notice other faces concealed behind the first image. These multi-layered paintings revolve around the artist's exploration regarding the complexities of human personality and relationship. Most of the time, we only show what we want others to see. The truth is, behind every smile lies an untold story. Yao Biling continues her early narratives and signature style of using vibrant colors through the Women series, which was painted in 2013. These paintings depict her personal shift from one identity to another, from single woman to wife to mother. From being a desirable young woman that she was, to becoming less of what the society dictates her to be. Some paintings highlight figures of these young, attractive women, while others portray different scenes of mother caring for a child, underlining the multiple roles of being a woman. Each step forward in this winding road leads to the woman that she is today. Recurring motif of hands is repeated throughout her 2016 series called By Hands. In some of the paintings, large outlines of clasp hands foreground the canvas, while in others, grasping hands are juxtaposed in the background. The work reflects a deeply personal journey where the artist acted as a caretaker for a father who suffered various chronic illness. This experience has led her to an acceptance of the unknown. As she said, living with the unknown is part of the knowing. Finally, her most recent series, Interwoven Terrains, painted in 2019, can be viewed as a turning point in both her life and artistic practice. Having gone through a spectrum of emotions following her father's passing, she shifted to nature in order to find peace and gain new perspectives on life. In contrast with her previous series, the color palette here remains bright throughout, representing positivity and new beginning. If you take a look closer at some of her paintings, you would also notice a hint of blue sky on the top part of the canvases, symbolizing guidance and new hope. Some of the paintings are diptychs, a line with separate two canvases that are placed next to one another, symbolizing the shift from one phase of life to another. The act of moving on from the past and becoming a better version of ourself. This line serves as a scar that reminds us that although some things could not be undone, we should still learn to accept life as a whole. This work is cathartic, something that has served to purify and heal her, an awakening and revival. Okay, so that was the that was a six minute video of 25 years of um, Helia's life compressed into that video. Um, before I continue the, the conversation with Helia, I just wanted to share with say to all of you that if you have any questions that you may want to ask Beeling um, in the course of, or we will answer them at the end of this, this session, but you can key in your questions in, um, I think there's a panel on the right hand side in your, on, your, on your screens. So you can just key in the questions that we will try to answer 
pose the questions to Beeling later. Okay, so Beeling, you know, in your work, it's constantly, um, obviously, the, your, your, your work follows your life very closely, it follows your journey as an artist, as a human being, as a person. I just wanted to ask you, I mean, this is not always the case for other artists, how important is evolution or development in an artist's career, like to you? Uh, it's the the involvement to me is very very much close to the life of me, and it's very important that the whole artistic process uh, grow me a better person. So art is an uh, outlet and it's also a platform that I can I can bring some. Uh, comfort to myself as well as a, as a wonderful experience as I trying to uh, seek a long life journey. Okay, so I mean, and I think, you know, um, I think the sincerity of that actually comes through in, in your work. Um, and I, you know, I've been following your, 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 your career, you know, for 20 years. Um, and, you know, when I'm confronted with your work, or with any work of art, actually, it's it's more a feeling. It's it's you know I, the energy that permeates from an artwork is what hits me first. Um, and you know, it, the reason I want to focus today on two particular series by you, the By Hand series and Interwoven Terrains, is because when I first saw the By Hand series in 2016. I was really, um, the energy that came out of that was really quite different to any of your previous works, which had, which had always been a much more colorful palette. It, they had been quite joyous and um, they celebrated life to some extent. But when the By Hand series came out, I, I noticed there was something quite um, heavy, um, emotionally heavy, dark about them. Um, and that, that, that really um, made me question um, why or what what you were going through at the time? Can you maybe sort of elaborate on that? I mean, there are a couple a few images coming up now. Maybe you can elaborate on that. Yeah, from the you know, just give you a little bit of um, um, sharing upon this aspect on this hand series. Actually, during the moment, uh, I was I was experiencing a very uh, different things that happen in life, which is uh, one is what happened to my family which is um, my sisters children and my children um, in the family there was a very overwhelming um, a death tragedy happened and and my sister passed away in her house and and she left two kids and one is autistic and um, i was home to my son at the same time and and i I didn't expect this going to happen, and 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 my whole life in the sky went gray, and it's cloudy. And at the other hand, uh, I'm trying to make sense to myself how to handle this. At the same time, uh, my father physically went deteriorating very much because of the death and and unresolved. So um, during the time, I I got to work very quickly. You know, basically fix the kitchen uh, and my nephew and my nieces came over to stay with me. I have to run the whole entire experience of working from hand because there was also a very disturbing thing that um, she can't call me because she's autistic and she can't call me that night. And, and I can't do much for her to save her life. But anyhow, and that was my state of mind. And also the at the other end, I, I ran to my father and help him and assist him for all the treatment as he, he, he had a very difficult situation and physically he can't move. So um, since this experience of the hand has come into a clear picture, this event, um, the crisis event has, has I, you know, made, made me think back and all that. So I think it's very important to have this um, basic you know, our, our body as a tools to try to work things out, you know, in, in the most fast way. But my emotion, I can't work it out as I start to work on my hands. 
and I start to help the old and, and the young. So the whole experience is very overwhelming for me. And at the same time, I was trying to, to make sense to this unknown. So you can see the, the series, uh, these two pieces, the first one is the desire seat. And you see the desire seat, uh, which is an earlier slide. Uh, the ray dots and, and the hand was depicting on all the basic activity on what our hand can do. And I tried to do it with my nephew by teaching her because she has difficulty in learning and, and my son has to do planting together and all that. And then I come to this theory, this piece of the click. Uh, I have to learn a lot of things very quickly with the computer and, and the clicks has come into a moment on how uh, contemporary life has affected me. But at the other aspect, I go to slow down for the child or even my own son. And then the muddy color, as you can see, or zoom in to the click piece, and all has turned into a, a black and white charcoal as I work with the mud with them, you know, learning to plant. And at the same time, I bury my sister, collecting her, you know, ashes and all that. And then I go back to my dad and and, and I have to comfort my dad what actually happened and I got no answer. So during the time, this whole series uh, will change. You see the emotionally of the decaying process and, and, and the sorrowful mood. So I was trying to make sense. Um, the only way I turn to is, is my art and in my, in my studio. And I, I turn into an encouragement for myself to seek for how to overcome this and, and this unknown, that where are we going to head to, you know? I have no idea, but I found on my canvas, I found there was emotional rhythm that came through. I make sense to, to, to myself. Uh, you know, basically I mold on the canvas. I, I have my moaning moment and I heal myself to accept no answer. And, and come to unknown, and I have no answer for my dad as well. But I have one thing is my gesture of love, what my hand can do for the both side is to nurse them and to prepare them for what's going to come. And also to comfort my dad and, and give him the hugs and wash him, feed him and all that. I think that's, that's basically what the hands series came out from. And, and it's triggered me to have the courage to explore to explore my emotion and to heal myself along the way. So uh, the colors during that moment, and I didn't use uh, as my frequency palettes, bright and, and uh, high key tones, but that moment, truly a wonderful moment, yeah. Well, thank, thank you, Billing, for sharing, because I know, I mean, now, you know, on, on, on hearing you sharing about how this, this body of work was cathartic and healing for you. I think, I mean, I don't know, I think whether subconsciously or consciously, it, it really comes through in, in these works. Um, but I know that from here, you know, obviously, you know, when you're in a dark place, there's always, hopefully there's light, there's some light at the end of the tunnel. And I know that you, you, you went, you did a residency in Taiwan um, after, you know, after this period. Can you share a little bit with us about how Taiwan um, how Taiwan was a turning point or how it changed you? Uh, actually, I had this uh, opportunity to, to take a break away from all these life events. So I went for a short period of residency in Taipei under the Guangdu Art Residency. So this whole experience basically gave me a relief moment to, you know, to dislocate myself physically and emotionally because um, I went, it, it created another open door of experience, you know. So during that time, um, I actually went for many nature walks, especially, particularly, I walked a mountain. Uh, I took my two children along and we walked three hours on the mountain and different places on the mountain we walk. So um, that time, um, particularly, I, I believe that, that, that this mountainous control was my uh, huge interest because uh, this, this wave on building mature with the mountains right in front of my eye, it, it goes parallel with the, the emotion of me that 
I'm seeking for answer, but this continued horizon and and this control has has given me um a, a very different experience. Now I see, you know, from the hand series, it came to it came to I see uh, there's a hand behind this whole nature, and and I don't longer paint the hands because I know I'm part of this and I was made by this hand, which emotionally I see you know, the hand of the creator of this powerful nature. So this mountainous control came into the series. Uh, you can see uh, on the next slide where all the mountain control or the brown, you know, when I, I remember I went to this uh, place called Ye Liu and, and the marvelous on, on, the, on the control of horizon mixing with the sea and, and the mountain. So my life during the moment I came to the green pasture for that moment. So it was a great relief. I also have some good uh, bonding time with my children, as well as my husband. You know, he he, he support me uh, emotionally. Uh, you know, he has he has done a great uh, his comfort for me when I'm in this really difficult time. But this mountainous control is the main that I come to realize that there is a pen that creating this mountain series. Which is right in front of me, you know. So I, I, I'm very, I'm very triggered by that, and I carry back to my studio and work as is in the residency. I work on this small study, and 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 this control of a landscape on the mountain and the level, it's like a path in my heart where, where I, I, I had a healing along the way. Yeah. Uh, it's like you go along the process, but you don't know where are you going to again, on this mm. unknown. You know? Because mm. I send off my sister. And each time when I look into mountain and separate uh, from the sky, I know something's beyond this. So I had that spiritual space come into my art. Sure, sure. And you know, so this then led on to um, your last series, which the interwoven terrains. And I think when people, the images will come up shortly, I'm sure. Um, when you look at the interwoven terrains um, series, there's this great sense of hope and there's this great sense of I, I felt rebirth i felt hope there was enlightenment there was there was i would say happiness but I, I felt that suddenly this 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 body of work was like a revival for you you, you were you were suddenly the light was coming to you and it came through in the energy of this work can you share with us feeling like you know more you know about about about, about how this how this body of work sort of uh, arrived after by hand. See, um, after the hand series, and then go on to uh, my greatest interest to look into nature, because uh, during that time I also having um, a fear in me to paint figure because I I went through some process on in, in a funeral taking care of the six and the young and all that. I, I need a break from this whole overwhelming of dealing with people. And I I learned to deal with myself along the way. So I, I take a silent opposite, you know, this this landscape and this mountain has become a mirror to, you know, the other side is quiet, but I'm I'm in chaos. So I I emerging myself into a, another comforting uh, zone by looking at the nature as a part of unknown. Uh, so the mountainous horizon came because it, it traveled with me and I come home. And again, my father getting worse and, and he can't actually talk much. And he's on wheelchair all the time. And he, at the time he stayed with me and, and we talk a lot of things out. You know, just like we, we wheel back, just like I walk the mountain and view mountain after mountain. So I mm -hmm. hear my dad talk about how you how his childhood and how my childhood. Mm -hmm. I hear my dad talk about how he grew me up, how he struggled in, 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 in his life, and and the scene that you committed. This is a very personal conversation and, mm -hmm. and it's a very a very strong courage for me as I can't tell anyone and but I know 
and I'm very, I'm very thankful. My father is out as to me as a trust, and he's real before he leave this world. So during that time, I didn't pay him, but um, I, I spent a long time with him. Um, and then um, this whole feeling was on my canvas after, because uh, the interwoven experience uh, of my feeling, and, and you know, it's like you, you go to, from far, you look at the mountain, you look at the event in history. And now I come very close to the mountain, the horizon go missing. But I see the layering of the emotion coming out. Mm -hmm. So when I come back home, I face my dad and all the things been unfold. And I remember uh, it was a very significant moment. I took him after the hospital trip and, and we talk about it uh, silently with my mom. And I say, we need to have a last family portrait. So he, he went very quiet. He, he dressed himself. And we have a silent moment and we, we went to the studio. So mm. this is the moment where this is, this is a really difficult moment for me. So I, I, I get back home and I, I made a layering of emotion in my sketchbook. Mm. But it wasn't a painful thing because I know this is the process I need to go through and I know I'm accepting the un unknown is going to go through. So the hand uh, now has become a, a comforted blanket. It blanket over me because I have done the conversation with my dad. Mm. Uh, personally in the room. I also done my personal prayer. So I carry all this and I went on to my canvas. I have a primo moment because I know I'm going to lose him. So I, I lose him uh, before I, I say goodbye to him in the hospital. So he, he told me his wish. And also, you know, all this moment, uh, has turned onto my canvas, so I know he's going for a better place. So I remember I hold his hand, and, and the hand, uh, he told me the last word, I'm going for a long rest. So I'm so glad that we can have a heart-to-heart -heart moment talk, mm. and we have the photo, we have the last meal, his birthday, and we also have um, a goodbye. I sang into his ear and sent him off. I told him I cannot hold his hand anymore, so that was, sorry, that was a tremendous experience for me to send somebody off, you know, mm. internally. So um, the Interwoven's uh, Terrain series, as you can see, you know, Hearts of Joy, which is the slide, or uh, liberty of, uh, uh, you know, I, I come to a freedom of my emotion because, um, I have no guilt anymore. And I also feel that I have done all my best for him. Mm -hmm. We had a heart to heart chat. So that was, that was a courage moment for my father to tell me, you know, especially in Chinese family. <clears throat> yeah. and, and then uh, very much also the layers and the oil paint that I, I come into it, you know, it shows, as you can see the landscape, you know, the chaos has slowly come to resolve. And, and the horizon came to uh, into the picture slowly and, and the chaos in, in, in the way that I'm layering it. So sure. I the freedom of the emotions. And I, I believe that this art process <clears throat> from the time, <throat> I gained courage when I painted. I gained strength to go back for the next uh, expression, whether a next conversation with somebody else in my family or a strength that I invent and express myself. So I, I think my studio has become a great outlet and platform for me to, to, to relieve my feeling, to have a freedom of emotions, as well as it feels, yeah, that's, that's fantastic. And I really, I really, you know, thank God that I, I have this platform as, as a process, as an outlet to to engage and meet myself in this process, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I think, no, Beeling, thank you for sharing such, so hard, I mean, 
it's it's very heartfelt. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that very much because I think um, at the end of the day, um, you know, this is this is the cycle of life. This is you know, it's something that's inevitable. It's something that we we dread, I think, but it is inevitable at the end of the day. Um, but I think the the beautiful thing about this work, and I'm just going to add, is that there's so much hope in it. This you know, in these works, unlike by hands, which were dark and quite heavy. These works are light and they show that there's some resolution you've come you've come to after having gone through that journey with your dad and for having you know sort of come to come to terms with it to some extent. I, I don't think we'll ever get over it. Um, but I also wanted to point out that <clears throat> in a lot of these this series, the interwoven terrains, a lot of the pieces were diptychs. They were made on two canvases. Um, and and when I when when Gideon and I chatted about this. Um, um, during the course of the, the show, she ex explained to me the reason the there were there were a lot the, the most of the works were diptychs was because you know one side of it showed the person that she had been, and then the other side of it, which was marked by a line in the canvas, showed where she was going. And so it's you know at the end of the day we are we are changed by the experiences or the traumas that we go through the losses that we experience but as a whole we are still one but we are scarred but we we carry that scar with courage and with you know in pride I think right so um okay Beeling I'm just going to now quickly run to a few questions because there are a few questions that have come in um. One one of the we obviously we can't we can't I don't know if we can oh now hang on let me just go to this I am now okay let me just get to the questions okay so the first question that's come through is um, where do you see or how do you see your work developing from here I mean well I suppose you don't know where your where your your life is going but can you do you see where you're going from from this where this might lead you where this this set of landscapes might lead you next this is the first question. Uh if you ask me uh, where am I going to, I I truly don't know. But I'm I'm having a very uh, positive mind. Even even in this challenging moment now, we all experience. I believe uh, it will it will be a you know this good hopes that will be happen. You know, and and the strength that we have to we have to constantly lift it up ourselves. So I. I believe uh, life itself will take me to the next path. Uh, my only job is to stay truthful to life and, and to make a, a real honest experience to engage with myself. So a knowledge, a knowledge what I have now, like what I've experienced in, in the death, the death in the family, and, and also a, a knowledge that how I can learn to forgive others who, who can uh, who you find it very hard to love or you, you don't have answer why why uh, things doesn't go that way you know like why to me like for example uh, some of my family member didn't make it at the last moment to see my dad and that was that was very difficult for me to accept it but uh, now I understand, and I, I believe the, the the future path is not, it's not a scary thing for me. It's to accepting the unknown as part of the process that I need to find, you know, strength to from my art, mm. and also uh, to have courage to face this unknown. And it, it's pretty positive for me. But where is this going to head to? I don't know. But I I have a great passion that life is going to be beautiful again. No, thank you. No, there's there's definitely hope. Okay, the next question, um, because we've read, we've got to get on to the next question is, okay. So, um, it, the question is, um, do your family members connect with your art visually or emotionally, emotionally in the way that you've expressed to us? Do your own family members, um, feel? Um, I mean, understand you and your work. Uh, some of my niece and nephew they paint. Uh, they have strong interest. They went for art class, but for them to know um, what I'm doing and what I'm explaining of all these things, they don't. They don't understand honestly. But I see them every time. 
I show, you know, sometimes things caught more than told or, or, or taught. I, I'm not, I didn't make any effort to tell them why I paint this and it's about you or it's about us. No, they know I paint all this picture when they come over, they will laugh over it and they will tell me it's beautiful. But we have an unspoken moment every time we get together and the action that I, I try my best to love them, to show my presence in every event that they, 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 they call the reunions, every event that because our life itself that we live together as after our father left and you know i have a different faith that they 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 practice i'm a christian so when there's an event happen or a ceremony or whatever uh, they they have full uh, understanding on what what actually uh, who am i from my artwork and and never they miss to call me in any problem they have or I never miss to call them when I'm having some difficulty. So this is a great thing that I believe my father, which we all have after he left. So I, I don't talk art to them, but I my my life itself is, is a form of expression to them. So they know and and you know like they won't they won't they won't of uh, they won't give me a job <laughs> during the funeral, but they will accept. Christian gospel or during the funeral. Yeah. All right. Okay, and we have time for one last question. And the question is, because grief has been so much a part of this work, do you ponder what um, your work might be like if you hadn't experienced what you experienced? Where might it have gone? Just, I mean, just wondering if how your work might look if it hadn't, if you hadn't gone through what you've gone through. That's the final question. Uh, well, this is a imaginative question. <laughs> Julie, because I I honestly I have no bitterness over the state of life. I have no uh, negative feel, you know, I feel very thankful for all things that happened to me. And and all this thing is not for others, it's for me. Yes. And I'm I'm not trying to Paint my great story, but perhaps this process of art and art making and and this whole process has given me a, a, a great outlet and a platform to express myself and heal myself mm -hmm. and accepting the unknown is going to come. So I fully believe that this life is a great life and there's no others. So I never imagine if it's not this, but of course if it's not this. I believe I will with, with, you know, if I were born as an artist again, it, it will be the same things that I would deal with and I would love to deal with, yes. Sure. It's to meet myself, yes. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I think, well, thank you, Biling. I am for, thank you so much for, for sharing um, so honestly from, you know, from the bottom of your heart, because I think at the end of the day, um, well, I dare say this, but um, maybe the strongest art is the art that is the most, um, the most sincere and the art that is made not for anyone else but for the artist you know i think that at the end of the day that that really is what what is is important um so thank you all so much um we're going to now sort of um uh, move on to the next panelist thank you thank you Biling, for coming on and i'm go now going to um welcome um so chong hin so um Hi. okay um on to the thing okay so um okay great Hi, Chang Hin. Really? Good to see you. Um, so, um, basically, I'm just going to do a quick intro. So, um, So Chong Hin is one of Malaysia's most loved and well known figures on the local film scene. He's a multiple award winning writer, producer, um, and director for film, TV, and theatre. Um, his um, he directed the Puchi Gunung Le Dang, the movie, in 2004, and later co-wrote um, Puchi Gunung Le Dang, the musical, which made its debut in 2006 to critical acclaim. So today, I know, Chiang Han, you've got a wide body of work, but today we will be focusing on your film, You Mean the World to Me, um, which came out in 2017. Um, I think as it is probably your most personal um, a piece of work as it is semi-autobiographical and um, you know um, the film the film 
sort of touches on, 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 on so many um, areas that I think we can all relate to. Um, I'm just going to just say a little bit um, the, about the, the, the film was um, you got in Christ, we got in Christopher Doyle who was the um, who was a cinematographer and he also did the in, in the mood for love. So if you haven't watched the movie, um, you, all of you out there who haven't watched it, you must watch it. Um, it is uh, you can get it from I think on that on Astro on demand and you can download it there. So you, you have to watch the movie if you haven't already. So okay, so let me. Tell you, Tohin, when I watched the movie for the first time in 2017, when it first came out, it touched me so tremendously. I mean, I walked out of that theater and there were so many, so many emotions going through my head and so many things. And I think a lot of um, people, a lot of people who watched the movie went back to watch it two or three times because it had that much of an impact. And I think one of the, the reasons this happened was because your film deals with families. It deals with family issues, family problems, skeletons in the closet. Everyone comes from a family which is dysfunctional, I think, in some sense. So everyone can relate in their own way to, you know, what, what your film was saying. Um, you know, and, and I think the scars that come from... Um, what we go through as, as 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 human beings through a childhood, they are very emotional because they touch us when we are not in control of anything. We don't really understand ourselves, and we are forever sort of um, maybe imprisoned by that. I think as as human beings, um, and when it comes to family, it's always an emotional experience, um, and you know the film is very relatable on that level. So yesterday. I went online and watched the making of your movie, which was, again, a very emotional um, uh, 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 journey for me. Um, and one of the, the actresses said something really poignant, and she said, when you outgrow your emotions, then you will learn to love. And I thought, my God, that is so true, because oftentimes we are so bogged down by, you know, how we feel that we lose sight of really what's important. So um, I, know, I know it took you tremendous courage to, to make the movie. Um, and I just wanted, I'm, I'm so happy you're here today. And um, I just wanted to ask if you could share with us what finally prompted you to tell this story, because I understand, you know, you had to go through a lot to, to put it together. Okay, actually, um, well, the journey kind of started for me about 10 years ago with this, with that film, with that project. Um, at that point, um, I was going through like a little midlife crisis, you know, because I, I've done quite a bit of work, and, uh, work that's quite well received and, and um, some acclaim and all that as well. But I felt that there was no work that was truly representative of me. You see, so nothing that was truly my voice. Um, well, before I carry on, I have to say that nothing in film is truly your voice because it's a collaborative process with with the uh, DOP, with the production designer, with the editor, with everybody. But Absolutely. something at least closer to who you are as a person, I felt. Mm. I, I didn't have sure. that, you know. Of course, all the other films, I also injected elements of my 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 personality, I guess, and I, I guess my uh, preferences or, or taste in whenever you make a film, you inflict your, your sensibilities on it, you know, for better or worse. Yeah, the, the colors you pick, the wardrobe, the background, the, the location, what the angles, whatever, you know, so you can't run away from that. Um, mm. But I felt that in terms of a tone, in terms of, um, of, of what it was trying to say, I wanted something that at least is more representative of me as a person. And okay. that's when I started writing this. Okay. Um, it was a really, really tough process because you spend your whole life putting away ugly memories, you know, mm. like tucking them away in a corner somewhere. And then suddenly in this process of writing, you bring it all forth, you know, to the fore. And you relive it again uh, literally so it was quite shattering for me when i was going when, when i was doing that but at the same time it was quite freeing you feel you actually literally feel lighter 
it's, yeah. it's, it's, I don't know how to explain it, you know, and, and, so, and it was very fast, easy for me to write because I wrote the first draft in like three days or four days. Oh, you know, it just okay. wow. because it's it literally it's like, outpouring. Yeah, yeah like a di diarrhea thing. You just go and it all comes out, and you just put it down and all that. And then, of course, it took a little while more for me to edit because sure. uh, the edit process was actually harder. Um, because all the things are personal, and all the things are important to you. You know, I mean, mm. uh, so mm. I had to really, literally, be. Uh, remove myself from the process like kind of like a third eye like that you know and of course and say okay what is the story mm. and then start to trim everything down to it and i ended up with uh, the film you you saw lah. yeah yeah absolutely but it started off I, I understand as a as you wrote it as a screen as a play right it was performed as a play before it was adapted into a film so just wondering how how different is the the play from the movie and which which one sort of best sort of um you know encapsulates what you were trying to say best it started as a film script it started as a yeah. film script but the thing okay. about it that was that, that i couldn't find the money for it because I went around, I, of course, I went to see produce, uh, investors about it and all that, and everybody sure. was saying, oh, it's too dark, uh, um, it will not work, it has no commercial possibilities and all that. And mm. and so mm. I put it in a drawer. And then at some point, um, Georgetown Festival, Josie Day contacted me and said, hey, you want to do you have, want to do anything this year or not? Anything you have in mind? Mm. Then I, of course, submitted uh, this idea, this proposal, I sent it in, and it happened. So um, Wonderful. I managed to stage it, and from at the staging, some investors uh, were there. Some investors were in, uh, attending Georgetown Festival. Uh, actually, turned okay. uh, up at the thing because I, um, I'm not that savvy. I, I didn't really like invite everybody to come and potentially uh, watch this so that you can invest <laughs> in my film. You know, right. I was already so overwhelmed with the play and the rehearsal the play and the process and yes. i just didn't think you know but thankfully yeah. there were some people in the audience who saw it and they said mm. oh my god we have to make this mm. you know and then they mm. understood the tone better because words on paper sure. are words on paper sure. you know and it doesn't truly capture the i guess the um reconciliation i was going for you know mm. or maybe it's mm -hmm. my writing you know, but right, um, right. when they saw it, when they saw the play, they said, "My God, it's really uh, a little. There's a little uplift at the end. You're trying to make amends, you know. Sure, so that's sure. not as weak as people thought it, it would be, you know. Mm, no, and of course. from there, I got to make a film. And to answer the question about the differences between the play and the film, um, the play. Obviously, resources for plays are more limited. Yeah. Right. And uh, right. and so, but I, I I still managed to do the staging that I wanted to to present the the, the play, uh, but reduce the number of characters and all that. So kept it to essential. Even then, I think it was quite a largish largish uh, cast. Um. Yeah. Well, long story short, it went really really well, and the film. Um, when I shot the film, the, my first edit for the film was different. It, mm. It's more closer. It's closer to the script. But then, okay. Um, okay. a famous Taiwanese editor um, mm. came across my my film because I was finishing the film in his uh, lab, and mm. he saw the edit and he took it upon himself to to suggest the uh, the changes that led to the final form of the film. Oh, I mean when. Okay. Okay. Yeah. When I looked at the film, when at first when he um shared it with me, I went like, oh, because it's weird. Because in your head, you've been working on something for so many months, mm, and you have seen it, cut it, and so it in a certain way. And when presented with an alternative, my first uh, reaction was actually, no la, you know. Then yeah, yeah. I thought, okay, I'll be fair. Because this man obviously is moved enough or cared enough to actually yeah. invest his time. And he's a famous mm -hmm. editor. He he that this one who sells the the big big boy in Taiwan. Right. So I thought I looked at it again and I I went, actually, it's a better edit. You know, okay. and that's how 
Fantastic. No, I, I think, you know, yeah, the, I mean, the, you know, the, 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 the film is, is quite, I think the one of the defining moments in the film was really when it went from something that was quite fictional, something that was going around trying to you know, make his film, and then it cut into something that was real life. So it cut into, you know, it sort of, there was something surreal about that. It went from being fiction into reality. Can you just share a bit about that? I mean, was that sort of, that was obviously intentional, but was it intentional because you were, you wanted to splice in that it was more autobiographical in some way? Um, yeah um okay all to me i mean of, uh, my opinion is that all creation all creative impulses uh, are born from a compulsion yeah. uh, sometimes a compulsion that we ourselves don't understand at that point why we needed to do it mm. and um and you find ways of expressing it i mean even talking to a, a good friend or some people even talking to psychiatrists or, or whatever it's a form of expression. You have Absolutely. to say it. You have to just yeah. get it off your chest. Yeah, yeah. So for me, it was that. It started from there. It start. It started from the need to to do it. But along the way, because film is a commercial entity, you mm. have this um, different consideration. I mean, mm. I, I'm, most people don't like to talk about this, but you can never have an, everything 100% your way because unless you are the one coming up with all the money and all, and all that sure. and in this case it wasn't, I, I was a co-producer, co-investor in the film but I wasn't uh, fully um, responsible in charge. Yeah. yeah, so of course you do the best you can and of course there's a certain level of trust and, and uh, we had a, I had a strong working relationship with Astro so um, they gave me quite a lot of leeway and I dare to say the film ended up being what I wanted it to be. Lah. But the intentional, the thing is a reflection of, I guess you can see a parallel to my life, yeah. you know, yes. because I, Absolutely. in the film yeah. is a, a, also a film director, the character is also a film director. And, and also I, the reason why I, I made sure I did that is because Everything about the film is my memory of events or based on events that I remember, sure. Sure. which is not necessarily correct or 100% mm. correct. True. Mm. I mean, you have, can have three people in one discussion, all three will walk away, 10 years time they talk about it, they'll remember it differently. They'll say, oh, that, that woman was lovely, oh, that woman was nasty, or, you know, yeah. it's all different. So, I wanted it to be very clear that it is only my point of view. Mm. Mm. It's my point of view. Uh, I'm not saying this is the absolute truth. I'm sure. saying this is what I remember. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Yeah, I mean, I supported that kind of like with the, the opening image of the tap leaking. You know, I mean, it's unreliable. Memory is unreliable. Mm. We don't know mm. that we think mm. about that. Sometimes mm. you don't know whether it's correct or not. You know, um, yeah. yeah, stuff like that. Lah. Yeah. And actually, somebody else has mentioned what you said and also he he posted on Facebook. He didn't tell me um, yeah. personally. Uh, he watched yeah. the film poster. It said it's, it's really, really meta, which is true because it's a film about a, a director making a film uh, um, about his family. So mm. and and towards the end, I mean, aside from the layer you mentioned, at the end when uh, when the whole thing finishes and you hear cut. Mm. That's the even one more layer to say that yeah. actually even what you're watching here is a film, you know? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Exactly. So exactly. I'm happy with that. Yeah. You know, no, it was yeah, it was it was really yeah, something special. Okay, so let me just ask you, okay, quickly. Um you've said in one of your a few of your interviews, you know, you said love is sacrifice. Love is sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Can you just, I, I mean, you know, I know, and, and today is Mother's Day, la, you know, so look, I yeah. think mothers all sacrifice, right? So maybe just expand on that a little bit, uh, on that, on that notion a little bit for us. Okay, I mean, that perspective kind of came to me a little bit late in my life, I must say, because mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe I was the youngest child and I was kind of like my dad's favorite uh, son and, and all that. So I, I'm kind of like pampered and spoiled. 
I, I dare say, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in compared to my brothers and sisters, they constantly pointed up to me. <laughs> like, like that, you know, um, and in that selfish mode, you don't recognize a lot of things that others do for you, you know, because. Sure you only think about what impacts you and of course as a young young person it's something something you're not happy with mm. um either you resent or you push back or you whatever you know what i mean huh? but yeah. only with only with age did i realize that that there should be more trust and love you know because you trust that the person is not trying to hurt you why would she mm. i mean if she's your mother you know what i mean she might not be of saying course. things that she might not be saying things that you want to hear, but why would she want to hurt you? You know. Yeah. So I mean, I didn't have that perspective until I wrote the film. Mm. As I was writing, I was still trying to come mm. to terms with some of the choices she made. You know, like mm. are you? Yeah. And I said, why did she do that? Why did she do this? Mm. You know. Mm. And of course, angry young man. You know, but uh, eventually that writing helped me come to terms with it and I, yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm, I trust I'm better for it. Yeah, no, I, I mean, you know, I think today, I mean, with, with the discussion we're having, I think all the, all the panelists, what has been wonderful is that each of you has been able to reconcile something through an outlet, through being able to create something and to say something through the work that you do. And I think by having that, it has helped you all to heal. Um, not not every I mean you know not everybody has this has this ability or has an outlet or of expression for expression you know um, so I can I just quickly end this um, this 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 um, conversation with the last question which what what do you think makes art powerful actually if we knew we all would be making that art only but I mean if I had to hazard a guess um, anything that's honest, authentic, you know, like comes from a really personal place, mm. um, would resonate with someone else. Because, I mean, as human beings, I think one of, why do we gather at stadiums to watch sports? Why do we gather in cinemas to watch a film? Is a joint experience, uh, experiencing tension, drama, love, hate, everything together. You know, I, I mean, and that what that shows is that we have that, common bond, the, this common feelings, you know, uh, basic tenets of uh, being a human cover cover this, these things. And, and as long as you are honest, I feel, or uh, and authentic, it will resonate with someone, you know, and, and that's when it gets its power, so to speak. Mm. Yes, yes. The minute you try to construct it, which is mm. usually the case in film, um mm. it could it could work against it so the, the construction has to be really sensitive and mm. you i mean the question i i can only answer for myself and the question i ask myself is always why am i doing this what's the reason for me uh, doing this project sure. you know sure. yeah sure. so it, it will have to go back to that you know if, if it's a question of making money you and i know that there's much more money uh, outside of the <laughs> yeah, I know exactly. Okay, so John, we're going to finish up with just one a question that's just come through, and it is: While filming the more emotionally difficult scenes, were you able to look back at those moments with more closure? And if so, do share which scene in particular? Okay, I think. Shockingly, it was more than one scene for me because I mean, yeah, it was quite a, um, a, quite a traumatic time in my life, you know. Mm. I mean, at least mm. from what I remember, I'm um, even from the first instance of when I stepped onto the set, which is a recreation of uh, my family home last time, mm. I was already caring mm. it, because it obviously contain a lot of uh, memories, good and bad, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it kind of triggered everything. Like, I mean, you go in and you, my God, it's exactly the same. And the other mm -hmm. actor, Ray, did such a wonderful job with it. You go like, wow. And 
and during luckily we had rehearsals for some some of the things or luck and also luckily i did the play before then yeah because yeah, yeah. I, I cracked my heart out already <laughs> so on the film i wasn't such a mess but um yeah there were quite a few instances as well i mean i, mm. I, I won't go into specifics but sure. what i want to say what i want to say before we move on really mm. is that what was important to me is that the one thing that i remember very clearly i want to communicate with the film is that although the film to a large part remembers the not so nice incidents mm. at the end i had the scenes of the, the dancing and going out yes. to the picnic and all that it's what we choose to remember yeah yeah it's a choice true. of course it's not I that think. they were not good times there were good yes. times except that the the not so good times stayed with me like in in the corners in the dark corners of my mind and that mm. like you know, mm. Yes. Yeah. yeah so it's true. I would encourage everyone to just focus on the good, you know. Yeah. Of course, of course. I think. Well, I think. I think the bad, the the bad experiences shape us. Perhaps yeah. you know. Um. You know. They they make us give, give us character. They're character building. So we have to look at that from the positive. And of course, look. I'm going to end. I think what we'll do is, should we end this um section with playing the trailer to, to to the movie, so that people can end with that, and and then they can then they can then um. Hopefully, go watch it. I mean, they should. I will, I'm going to watch it again, I think, uh, <laughs> after this yeah. session okay. with you. Thank you so much, Wendy. Thank you, Pat. Thank you so much, Xiong Hin. So we'll play the we'll play the the trailer to the movie so that all of you can sort of watch it, and then we'll move on to Dan and Chris Tantra. Thanks, Xiong Hin, for your time. It's wonderful okay, to hear you speak. Bye. You must be Hee Jit Chut Tansky, director, lah. Why do I go with how say ah? Ah, na Chut Mia. I'm Thank you for that, um, Bill. So, okay, so now we're going to move on um, to um, speak to, um, well, to talk, look at the work of Dadan Cristanto, um, an Indonesian artist. Dadan Cristanto is perhaps one of Indonesia's most well known um, international artists. Um, he's from a generation of um, Asian artists who first showed, I think, the world what Asian contemporary art stood for. And he then went on to represent um, Indonesia in at the Asia Asia Pacific Triennale in, in Brisbane in 1993, in the Sao Paulo Biennale in Brazil in 1998, at the Venice Art Biennale. So he's he's shown internationally. Um, Dadang was born in Tegal. Um, a small village in central Java um, to a family of Chinese descent. Um, and his work has consistently highlighted um, and paid homage to the victims of political violence, um, of crimes against humanity. Um, and this stems from a very personal and emotional narrative, which he has interwoven into his work consistently over the years. Because um, as an eight-year-old um, boy, he watched um, hopelessly um, as his father was forcefully taken from their family home and he was never to be seen again. And so, you know, a tragedy of that magnitude, um, you know, weighs heavily on anybody. And with, for Dadang, it was, it was, it's, it's been something that he's, he's carried till today. Um, and he has used, you know, through his art, his art as a conduit to heal, to inspire, to, to not let people forget that these sort of things ha happen 
to people and to human beings and he's consistently created awareness of the plight of those who are vulnerable and who have who are voiceless okay so um today um we're gonna have can we is amanda coming on board um now we're going to have Amanda is going to join us. Hi, Amanda. Hi. So Amanda Hi, um, is going to be um, joining us today because I think Dadang is not feeling so well, right? Yeah, Dadang is not feeling so well, but he's here with us. And then if you have questions, then um, you can still drop the question in the chat box below. So yeah. And we will, he will, we can, be he will add questions. to this, but he won't be showing his face on the yeah, <laughs> video today. Unfortunately, yeah. Um, so, um, I think Amanda, I've, I've done the introduction to Dadang, so I'm going to hand it over to you to just do a short presentation about about Dadang's work, and so that we can then move on to to the body of work that we'll be discussing today. Okay, sure. Can you see my uh, screen now? Yes, we can see your screen. Yes, we can start. I will. I will make myself scarce then. I will close my video, and then you can continue. All right, there we go. Okay, so Waiting uh, explained already that uh, Dadang was born in 1957 in Tagal, Central Java. So uh, he studied uh, in Indonesia and then later on in the 90s he moved to Australia. Um, so these are basically the themes of his practice. Um, the particular problem that he, that he talks about in his work is really the 1965 to 1967 transition from the old order to the new order in Indonesia. So um, I don't, you probably heard of it because it was a um, violent transition for, for Indonesia at that time because uh, the old order, which was led by Sukarno, um, and, and the new order, which was led by Suharto, was not really, um, I mean, the transition was really uh, violent because. Uh, at that time, by 1965, there were two really strong forces in Indonesia, which were the army and the anti-communist party. And uh, the army being led by Suharto at that time um, really was, was of course, um, really opposed the anti-communists. And so uh, because of that, the transition be became very violent. So in uh, in the 30th of September, September 1965, basically uh, six of the senior officers of the army were killed. And of course, um, Suharto being the, the major general at that time, he, he controlled, he mobilized uh, the big cities in Jakarta and the anti-communist and minority push at that time started because uh, most of the, the communists uh, came from Chinese ethnic. And so the hatred against Chinese ethnic really emerged at that time. So this created a whole social stigma, which even led to mass killing or genocide. And this has affected Dadang personally, because as a young boy, he, uh, he lost his father. His father was uh, went missing and, and never really came back. And this tragedy, basically became the main background of his practice. And so it extended further to talking about human suffering uh, as, a, as something that's experienced internationally, I mean, universally, because human suffering is not just uh, in a personal level, but you know, it's something that we can relate to, that anyone can just relate to. And that's why his work became powerful, I guess. It's, it's, really, it's really how it can unite people uh, can speak the voices of the people. So he also talks about trauma and history. And so he collects archives uh, because as, as you all know, uh, history is always written by someone. And so uh, what he's trying to do is, is really reveal other histories. So at that time in the 90s, there was this big debate whether or not Asian art can be contemporary. And Zadan Presento was one of the first um, Southeast Asian artists to be to, to represent really Southeast Asia in international platforms showing Southeast Asian contemporary art. So he was invited in 1991 to residency and um, an, a forum where he spoke about uh, his views. And 
since then he decided to to reside or to stay in Australia. So this was his early work um, as a result of that residency. So as you can see, the figures of heads were already present in the work. And this is really why we would like to show you his past works. It's really um, because you see that there is actually a pattern or there is a recurring motif in his work, uh, which are the heads and human figures. Here it's, it's in, in a more abstract form. So um, basically, he was the first artist invited to the first uh, Asia Pacific Triennale of Contemporary Art in 1993. And if you see here, um, surrounding the sculptures are offerings basically that people gave um, to respect the victims of any kind of human suffering. So it was an, as an international platform, of course, people from all over the world came and they uh, basically left uh, a piece of their belonging there, could be anything. And in 1996, uh, he was commissioned to do this work. So these are life-size figures of, um, of sculptures made out of, of, fiber, of sorry, terracotta. So it's called the 1001 Earth Humans in, in Anchol. So again, figures of human beings are present and they basically represent, they could represent hum, human beings in general, or they could also represent victims. And in 1997, he developed that this human figure series further, and it was shown in Fukuoka. Um, so here, basically, these are victims holding the bodies of another victim. Yeah, so four of these, four of twenty figures were collected by this museum, and then it traveled to until um, the remaining sixteen standing figures became part of the the Asian wing of the Art Gallery of New South Wales in Sydney. So it was the inaugural work for their contemporary Asian wing. So again, human figures and, and heads have always been um, the recurring motif in his, in his work, in his body of work. So here uh, in 2004, he was commissioned to do the seeds at the sculpture garden of the National Gallery of Australia in Canberra. It's called the Heads from the North, made out of bronze. And in 2018, we had the honor to uh, basically at Whaling Gallery, he did this, this uh, very massive installation. It's called Missing. And uh, it's this very interesting piece because uh, as I explained, he lost his father when he was young and he has never found any trace of his father ever since. But then one day uh, when he came back to Tugal, to his village, he basically spoke to a friend. Uh, and that friend works until now at the... Um, at a government office in Tagal, and it's a very old building. Um, and it's the, the government office has always been there, basically in the same building since the 60s. And one day, uh, that friend actually found archives of, of people who have been kidnapped, tortured, and photographed, basically. Um, and that friend was very sure that basically Dada's father uh, could be in one of the photos, but of course, I mean, Dada was, didn't really want to see the photos. And instead he reimagined these photos. So he reimagined the photos into this installation. Okay, fantastic, Amanda, thank um, you for that. Yeah, so we're gonna now move into um, the main work that we're gonna be discussing today. And this is the Lumpur, these are the, it's called Survival, it was made in 2014. Um, and um, I think we're just, I'm just going to give a quick introduction, right, about, about this. So I think the, the, the most, um, I think this body of work was something we wanted to show because um, it is something that even for myself, when I first saw it, it made me sit up and think, oh my gosh, is that what really happened to these people? So what happened was, um, there was a fracking incident in Indonesia when they were 
there were people, a uh, big company was drilling for oil um, in, 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 in East Java. And due to whatever reason, I think, I think they, did, they drilled a bit deeper than they should have and they hit a mud line. And as a result of that mud line, the, there, were, there were, I think, 16 villages were destroyed by a flooding of mud and 60,000 people lost their homes, right? Is that correct, Manda? Um, so um, if you look at the, what happened was Dadang heard about these people and he took on their plight. He went to the villages and he felt compelled to make a project, okay? Um, that would highlight what these people were going through. So this is Dadang, he's talking to the villagers, you know, a lot of them, they, they were not, not really educated. They didn't really have a voice to speak up, to, 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 to fight for their rights. You know, there was nothing they could do. And I think he could commiserate with them in many ways. Um, Amanda, can we have the, do you want to just expand on that next? What's the next slide? Okay. Yeah, maybe we'll just expand. So basically, I think what happens here is that you can see that Dadang um, created um, some life-size um, sculptures made of concrete and he placed them, the 110 sculptures, he placed them in the middle of this area where the villagers houses had been. So these, this area that, where you see these, village, these, these, these concrete sculptures, they were placed exactly where the villagers the homes had been. And over the course of a year and a half, Dadang kept going back to this place and documenting what happened to these sculptures. So if you imagine these sculptures, I think they're about six, seven feet in height, and they're all holding household items like a pot or a cushion or a teddy bear, things that belonged to the villages um, of, of, the, of, the, of this Lupindo area. And so what you will see is over the, can we go to the next slide? If we go to the next slide, you will see with time what happened to this these images and then visually it it informs us what actually happened or what these villages experienced so um i think this was a this was a very compelling body of work are we i think we're not ah there we go so you can see you know over the course of that that, that time the mud just kept rising and um you know the the, the these 110 um, sculptures were eventually submerged absolutely and completely by the mud. And it just makes you think, well, goodness, you know, if human beings have been there, that they've lost absolutely everything. Um, and so this, um, um, there was a documentary that's been made about this, um, this, um, incident, right? Amanda, can you just maybe share a little bit about, about this documentary with us? Yeah, sure. So uh, it's entry that, uh, that that was directed by Cynthia Wade and Sasha Friedlander. Uh, so these directors basically uh, they they went to the to the Lumpur Lapindo mud flow, and um, it basically kind of compares the different views. Because of course a lot of people were blaming the company, is it the the oil fracking, uh, but then also um, there was no justice to it. I mean, I mean, nothing happened. Um, the villagers were told that they would they would be ever evacuated to a new home, and then they would receive a certain amount of money, etc. But then it actually never happened. So the, this is really about like the the, uh, the effects of of the tragedy tragedy from the point of view of not just the villagers but also. Um, different media, that different news about it. So mm. it became a scandal. Uh, until today, it's, it's still unsolved. Yeah. So the sculpture is now, of course, um, covered by the mud. It's no longer there, and it just proves how you know how how crazy it is. How how much the mud has has rise and and still it continues to um, rise, right? It's continuing to rise. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it continues, continues to, to rise. rise. Yeah. And it's now sulfur, so. And it's very dangerous for um, to live there. And there are still mm -hmm. people uh, working near the site until today. Um, so yeah, the, the question of security is still not. 
So I think, you know, I mean, through, you see, through this, through this work that Dadang made, um, it really just sort of, um, it really sort of underscores how art, just through a visual process, um, how much it can, um, how, how, how it can make us aware of things. And I think in, in the case of Dadang, his work has always been about, um, his work has always been about um, creating awareness and helping to make the world a better place, how to change things. You know, um, so um, I want to. Is that an online with you, um, Amanda, at this point? Um, it's just uh, he's on WhatsApp, but he's unable to speak. Okay, so quickly, there's a question that he is coming. Yeah, the question is coming. Um, and can you see the question? It says, um, No, you can't see it. So it says, um, Hello, Amanda Inibu Ines, Saya Senang Mendengar Paparan Jantang Mas Dadang Ini. No, oh, it... I, Ibu Ines is uh, the wife of Jiang Kuto. Okay, okay, fine. Okay, so there's not really a question. She's just sort of, sort of sending it for now. Okay, so, um, yeah, so I think really, um, yeah, so, okay, so really this is, I think, Dadang's, Dadang's um, practice and his work continues to um, underscore um, these kind of issues. And I hope that moving forward, I think he will be making um, more projects that are on a more community scale, which is not so much commercial, but it's really in his quest to um, change the world in his own, in his own little way that he, the way that he knows how and the way that he can. And, um, and I think that, um, I think today's, our conversation today with our three panelists um, serves to underscore um, the fact that, you know, as long as one is sincere and um, committed and um, honest to what they are trying to say through their work and in the, in the, in the process, they are, um, well, they are healing themselves, they are empowering themselves, and they are, um, they are hopefully um, inspiring people to to have a different outlook or to change and to to um, to see things a bit differently and to maybe make a change eventually. So I think let's should we end with uh, this this whole um, panel session with um, uh, the short introduction to grit, which you all can watch, and then we will also send you the link. And um, I will, I'm going to sign off and say thank you all so much um, oh, for being here with us um, today, for spending one and a half hours <laughs> listening to our first um, discussion on, our, on the WLG discussion lab. Thank you all for, for being here. We, we're really, really touched and have a wonderful Mother's Day and a, and a great Sunday ahead. So I'm going to leave you with the, with the, the GRIT um, docu documentaries trailer. Okay, thank you. terjadi tsunami lumpur. Kami lari menyelamatkan diri. Kejadian lumpur ini berdampak pada semua orang yang saya kenal. Saya mengatakan, kita akan terus mendesak Lapindo untuk mengembalikan apa yang sudah hilang sampai lumpur berhenti keluar. Selesai, nggak ada tanggung jawab selain saham barangkali, ya kan? Dinyatakan Mahkamah Agung tidak bersalah. Kalian adalah generasi ke depan. Bahwa kita akan menjadi bangsa yang berkualitas. Saya minta tolong sekali biar teman-teman bisa datang. Di mana suaramu? Jangan di
kalian, kemenangan yang kalian impikan.